Good morning, everyone, and welcome. This webinar is brought to you by Strategies 2.0, a statewide collaborative funded by the California Office of Child Abuse Prevention. Today's webinar is Parents and Community Engagement Dynamics. The webinar is scheduled from 10 until 11.30 a.m. My name is Carrie Collins, and I will be your facilitator today. My role is to introduce the topic and presenter, keep track of our time, and help the presenter and participants in any way that is needed. In a moment, I will introduce our presenter to you, but first I want to go over just a few of our webinar guidelines. So all of you have a little task bar, and you can see a red arrow. You can push that red arrow in and out. To, uh, to minimize the taskbar if you don't want to see it. Um, you also can join us today either by telephone or you can be using your computer microphone and speakers. If for some reason the sound uh, seems a little warbled to you, we recommend that you join us by telephone. If you click on the little telephone dot, it will give you the phone number, it will give you an access code, and it will give you a PIN number. It's really important that you enter all of those numbers just in case you want to ask a question on your own. I would not be able to unmute you if you had not entered all of those numbers. We're going to do a lot with the chat box today, so you all see where your chat box is. So throughout the presentation today, uh, Greg will be asking you some questions, and we really, really encourage you to enter your responses in the chat box. We will also be doing a couple of polling questions, at which time you will respond to the poll, and then we will show you the results to that poll. Um, there also is a hand-raising icon. So when we are in a section where there are questions, you know, Greg opens it up for you to answer que ask questions. If you click on that icon, uh, either myself or my colleague Shane would be able to unmute you, and then you can ask the question on your own. The PowerPoint will be sent to you following the presentation. That's always a question that comes up. So we want you to know that the PowerPoint and the link to the recording uh, will all be sent to you following the presentation today. I do have all of you muted. Uh, otherwise, we would be hearing a lot of background noise. So I want you all to know that you are muted at this time. So you don't need to worry if there is background noise in your house or at your office, wherever you are. We cannot hear that. The only ones that are unmuted at this time are Greg and myself. So with that, I'd like to introduce our presenter to you today. It's my pleasure to welcome Gregory Bourne the Executive Director of LEAD for Tomorrow as our presenter today. Greg is the co-founder of LEAD for Tomorrow, and he has been working in the area, in the arena of community engagement for more than 30 years, during which time he has led numerous training sessions on topics such as community involvement, conflict resolution, collaborative problem solving, and leadership. He has served as a consultant to a wide range of public agencies and worked with citizen advocates across the socioeconomic and racial spectrum. It is such an honor to have Greg with us today. At this time, I am going to make him the presenter. So let me just do that. Greg is there. And he will be sharing his screen with you at this time. Great. Carrie, thank you very much. It's uh, good to be with you all today. I wish we could be doing this uh, in person with each other. Um, I think it always uh, makes for a little better dynamic, but I'm looking forward to this webinar. And uh, I guess uh, we've put my webcam on so you can see that I'm a real person uh, sitting here um, in front of you. And uh, I wish I could see all of you, but we'll do the best we can. Uh, thanks for, for joining us. Um, as Carrie mentioned, I've been doing work in the arena of community engagement for many years, and it's something that um, I get excited about because I think it's really at the heart of democracy. It's at the heart of 
uh, of problem solving and uh, as we now uh, all of us working in the arena of healthy, healthy families and communities I think it's really really critical in the work that we all do um, so along the way we, we can talk about some specific projects as they come up I really as Carrie mentioned I'd like to make this as interactive as possible I will be asking some specific questions as we go but in the meantime if you have a question about something I'm saying um, please by all means indicate that to Carrie and I'll try to respond to them as you know any questions as best we can as we go so with that said um, let's move forward uh, If I could just get my slides to move. They seem to be frozen. Okay, we didn't check click, on this. <laughs> just click on your slide and then it should move forward. Just do a real quick little click on your slide and then it should move forward. Oh, there we go. Okay. It had been sitting there for too long. I guess it was frozen. I'm going to give you just a little, <laughs> bit, a little bit of background about our organization just so you have a little bit of context for where I'm coming from in this work and what our organization is involved with and hopefully that will be helpful. I won't spend too much time with that. But just simply to say Lead for Tomorrow, uh, we we formed Lead for Tomorrow at the end of 2011. Uh, we uh, have been working hard on issues uh, around our mission statement here, which is working to create sound families, thriving communities, and a more peaceful world. And this comes from the backgrounds of those of us that founded the organization and, and my colleagues who work with me now. We have really three primary program areas. I, I, I think many of you may have um, encountered our uh, Family Huey program, our Positive Parenting program, and Lucy Roberts, who directs that program for us, um, is doing a great job with that. Uh, we do have a, a, an OCAP grant to uh, create a family leadership or parent leadership network around the state. So this has involved us um, using our Family Huey program uh, as a framework for that. It's in, engaged us in many communities around the state from Imperial County to the south and Siskiyou County to the north. So we pretty much are throughout the state. Um, that program really built on a, on, on a program that was developed in the Hawaiian Islands. Um, we, when we took the program over in 2011, we revised it and subsequent to that, um, since we brought it to California in 2014, uh, Lucy did a great job of bringing uh, trauma-informed and kind of more a resilience-focused uh, aspect to what we're doing, which we're real excited about. The second program we have is uh, community leadership. Through this program, um, I work both with communities, but also at the, at the level of parents and, and neighborhoods and very very local communities. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. I also work with uh, cities, uh, city councils, and directors of, of uh, departments within the communities to help them figure out how to engage the community in more effective ways. And our third program is uh, our East Africa Community and Family Health Initiative, where we're working in four countries in uh, in Eastern Africa, Tanzania, uh, uh, Kenya, Rwanda, and Uganda, um, with not only our Family Hui program, but other leadership programs that we're real excited about. So we have a lot of cross-cultural um, experience, and um, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go. So what is the purpose of today's webinar? In short, it's to explore how community engagement dynamics impact parents and the organizations working to support children and families. So a lot of what we'll be talking about today comes from a workshop I do for First Five Sacramento for recipients of their Community Connections Grants. Talk a little bit more about that later. But I think it's important to kind of understand how parents approach some of these issues as well as how organizations working with families approach these issues. And so we're going to look at it really from, from both sides. I thought it'd be good at this stage to just, it'd be helpful for me to just find out a little bit about um, who's participating today in terms of the kinds of organizations uh, and individuals. So I think, Carrie, you have a, a poll that you're going to operate for us. I do. So I just launched a poll for you to select the type of organization you work for. Uh, we've given you uh, five different choices here. 
<laughs> so go ahead and click on your answer. We'll leave this open for a little bit, but almost half of you have voted now, so we'll just keep this going for a little bit longer. I'm gonna I'm going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, one, and I'm going to share the results. So we have 19% that are with Family Resource Centers or an FRC network, 49% with other community-based nonprofits. Uh, don't have anybody here uh, with first five. Uh, we have 30% uh, with a county or a city agency and 3% with a statewide agency. I do have uh, other California Child Care Resource and Refer Referral Agency uh, in Alpine County. Thank you, Rachel, for typing that into the chat box. So there are our okay. results. Great. Great. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, we do work at kind of every level of government and it's, I, it's always helpful to kind of understand who's in the room and I think we, we all have different challenges, but I think there's some similarities that we can look at that will support us in the work we do at whatever, whatever level uh, we work. So these are some of the ideas we're going to explore today. Uh, hopefully this is um, consistent with your expectations and why you join the webinar. And um, there is actually going to be a time at the end of the webinar to just answer the question, what's missing? What, um, what might you like addressed that for whatever reason we have not touched on? And so I, I hope you will kind of keep that in mind as we go because you're more than happy to get to issues that are related, but maybe we didn't touch in enough detail or at all. We're going to talk a little bit about the dynamics that impact community engagement, and there are many that can either support or be an obstacle, and so we want to talk about some of those. We're going to look at community connections. What are some of the keys to interactions between parents and family support organizations? And there's certainly a number of, of uh, dynamics that, that impact that interrelationship. We're going to look a little bit at how can we help parents create their voice in their community. And I think a lot of times we don't give enough attention to this. We kind of think we know what parents need or families need and we act on that. And I think we could all agree that the more we understand their perspective and where they're coming from, we'll be more effective at meeting their needs within the context of the missions of our organization. And then because leadership plays a key role in this um, at many different levels, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, what I like to call facilitative leadership skills which is a form of leadership from doing work in this arena for, uh, as I say, I, won't, I don't want to say how long, but we'll just say a couple, more than a couple of decades. Uh, um, I want to share some ideas on that for you that I've worked, again, at, at kind of all levels of uh, inter interactivity on that. And then we're going to look at some basic principles on effective conflict resolution. Um, clearly, we could do entire workshops on any number of these topics, but we're going to try to just touch as effectively as we can on each of them. So I'd like to kind of ask you to engage now in the chat box on the question of what do you see as the primary obstacles to parent engagement in your organization or in your community? And I think if you are, are willing to share some of that, um, I think it will help us move beyond kind of the theoretical to the practical and the real. And that's what we want to try to do. So, yeah, I'd appreciate it if uh, some of you would maybe share your thoughts on some of the things that stand in the way of engaging parents in your organization or your community. So we have time. Uh, parents having time, resources, childcare, <clears throat> transportation, trust. Oh, trust is a good one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're all good because they all are definitely important. Yeah. Over-programming, that's interesting. So maybe keeping parents too busy, going in too many different directions. Um, they're busy enough as they are, so yeah. Right, we saw um, fear, lack of transportation, childcare. 
um, a lot of time. Uh, oh, yeah. parents, your organizations are working with parents only during typical work hours. Mental health, mental health issues, I'm assuming for the families, so a little bit of stigma around uh, reaching out for help. Time and priorities, what's in it for me? Oh, cultural, cultural norms came up. Wow, these are really excellent. Disconnect, unaware what's available. Very good. Yeah, these are all great uh, responses and exactly the kind of things that we've run into over the years. And I'm going to try to touch on as many of these as we can as we go through this. And um, you can, if you would like to make a comment, um, Carrie can. Uh, can un unmute you so that you can actually share with the whole group. And if you're willing to do that, please let her know, um, particularly as we go through the next couple slides. If you feel like um, we can go a little deeper, that would be great. I'll try to touch on as many of the things as I saw come across the board. And um, yeah, there are just some great points there. And a lot of them are resource related on your part, time on everybody's part. Uh, and so let's see what we can touch on here um, as, as much as possible. So when I work with community groups or in, and families in communities trying to perhaps start a program that will address the needs in, in their very specific localized community, we try to help folks think through uh, what's really going on in their community. I think a lot of times we get so busy, we we don't really maybe do the due diligence we need to, to really analyze and take more of a systems approach to understanding the dynamics that impact us in the work that we do. And so these are just a few ideas of things that we can do to try to help um, really get a better understanding of the communities we work with. And so we start with demographics and socioeconomics and educational levels. And clearly within any given community, and particularly those that cover a very broad uh, geographic area, this could be very wide. You, you, you know, you could have, um, you know, a wide range of, of educational backgrounds and socioeconomics and, you know, racial and ethnic representation. When we drill down to a little closer uh, or lo more localized areas, sometimes it becomes a little bit more monolithic. Um, and so uh, but it's, it's good to kind of know these dynamics and know the community we live in and how they see the world, the folks that are in our community see the world. And if they are, in, in California in particular, we have a lot of communities that build around uh, immigrants from a particular background and ethnicity, and, um, and these can be, as you all know, very diverse. And so the more we can understand how they see the world, We've been able to actually work a lot in the last year with uh, Afghani, Afghan immigrants. Um, and um, some of the challenges they encounter coming into a new culture with different ideas about how to raise children and sometimes not speaking, you know, the language and many times not speaking the language or maybe in particular the mom doesn't. Um, and so we, we really understand the importance of kind of understanding, you know, those dynamics. Also, it's important to look at the community institutions and resources that are available. Some of us have a full range, libraries, hospitals, mental health support, schools um, that are nearby. Others don't. We might have one or two of those um, kinds of resources available, but not all. So it's always good to kind of look at that and say, what kind of supports are there in addition to our organization on a localized level? And again, the, the larger geographic area you cover in your organization, this is going to be more varied, but uh, it's really always good to kind of look at who's providing what. A lot of times we go in and we map the resources in a community that can support families and, and share that with the family. So as somebody pointed out in the chat box, a lot of times parents just are not aware of what resources are available to them. So through our Family Who We program, as we engage parents, we really try to make sure they're aware um, of what, what resources are available to them. And of course, this is one of the five preventative factors that are so important to strengthen families. What are the forces which impact families negatively or positively? 
And this can be local politics, availability of resources. Um, you know, obviously some places can can uh, provide, uh, with some places the politics and the resources are really pro-family and other places not so much. They might be more pro-business or they might just not be sensitive to the needs of families. And I think when we see the work that's come out in recent years on brain research and the importance of parents, um, and I think more and more, um, you know, hopefully we're having more and more supports for families when we see the challenges that many fa families are facing around the country and in our state here in California. Uh, but it's just good to kind of chart those those impacts um, as, as best we can. And of course, politics changes with time. And um, we might have one regime that's really supportive and sensitive to the needs of families and others that are more business focused or focus on other issues. And so just being aware of that is important. And then what are the opportunities for and obstacles to improving the conditions of families? In other words, um, are there other groups we can partner with? If there's a library, a school, uh, these are the kind of things we look at in our work. Uh, we look to partner as often as we can. It not only gives other resources and provides other resources for families, but it helps us understand the community far better if we can work with libraries or work with schools and uh, FRCs and First Fives and CAPSIs and uh, all the groups that are involved with families. Uh, we, we always, when we go into a new community, partner with people that know the community best, and, and that's really important. And that way we can understand both the opportunities that are there as well as the obstacles. I, I guess this is probably a good time to talk about something we don't talk a lot about, but I think is really, really important, and that is the bias that we bring with us either individually or, with, or within our organizations um, that can be, that can get in the way of, of the way we interact with families. And one of the things I learned years ago was as, as a white male working in <clears throat> very diverse communities across the socioeconomic and racial spectrum, one of the things I learned early on was the importance of respecting people uh, and respecting um, their capabilities. I think a lot of times we think, okay, there's a person that's not highly educated, we're gonna to have to hold their hand through this whole thing. Well, the reality is they're likely very intelligent and can well do it on their own. And I think if we respect people's capabilities, um, they they realize that when, we, when we're paternalistic or, uh, you know, act as if people don't have the capacity to do certain things, they clearly uh, understand that. And since that, so I think, as I say, I think one of the early lessons I learned years and years ago was if we just show respect to the people working with whatever the situation, they sense that, and then we can work with people. If people feel like you know we're coming in from outside, we don't understand them, we don't understand their community, um, we're not going to be in a very good position to support and, and help folks. So I think that these two issues of, of bias, looking at our own bias, looking at the bias in our organization looking at then how can we overcome those biases and, and learn to respect people regardless of their ethnicity, race, education level, socioeconomics, all of that. Um, that that's just critical to being successful in working with communities. Cannot uh, overstate that enough. So let's drill down a little bit further because um, one of the things that I'll talk a little bit more about in a few minutes is uh, some community connection grants that First Five Sacramento is offering. And so when I work with, with parent leaders that are saying within their community, hey, we want to do something to help our community, it's important for them to kind of think about some of these things that we're about to look at. And I think it's also very important for organizations because this is, again, part of this kind of systems thinking. I think when we stovepipe our thinking about these things, we, we kind of lose out on some of the dynamics that impact what, what's impacting parents, but also what, what impacts our organizations and maybe keeps us from being and doing, you know, all that we can do. So what are the key issues facing the community related to family health, well-being, and sustainability? So sometimes a group is just looking at one issue, and um, let's just say they're starting a reading program for the community. But I think it's good for them to think about what else is going on, because they could be key partners, they could be competitors. For resources and people's time, as somebody pointed out, kind of 
over programming. Um, you know, that's actually probably a good problem to have in a lot of situations because um, a lot of times people don't have enough opportunities to to get support. But it's just good to know what else is going on and building around what really is facing your community. And it really requires a very localized perspective on that. Um, we can't be coming in, and of course, you're all working in communities, but again, the broader the geographic area, it's kind of harder to know exactly um, what every community in that geographic area is thinking and what they're facing, do our best. Um, but it's always good to ask people what they think the key issues are and the range so that you can take a more systematic look at things. What issues have been prioritized or need to be addressed? So in some cases, we know um, an issue will be prioritized in a particular community, uh, but there may be you know, other issues that have not been recognized that need to be. And so it's just good to kind of look at what's been prioritized as well as what needs to be addressed that nobody's paying attention to. And, um, and, and again, we, the only way we get that information is to talk, to talk to parents, talk to families, and really seek their input. It's kind of an asset-based approach to doing work. A lot of times we go in and we think we need to provide the assets, we need to provide the solutions. Every community has some asset. How do we identify what they are and help them build on their assets? It's very empowering, and that's where we kind of pull people out of um, always needing to be served to the point of actually taking leadership and getting engaged in themselves in making their community better. So that's really important. Then it's always good to look at who in the community is involved with the issues that are identified. Because again, um, this may give us links to potential resources, to partners, um, and kind of gives us a lay of the land. If we know that uh, there is a certain elected official or appointed official that's working, uh, that's great to know. Um, and other parents, teachers, or their organizations like all the ones represented on, in our webinar today. So it's really just good to kind of map that out. And so we're clear about um, who's working with us, and it leads to the next question, who might um, oppose efforts? I will say, having worked with social <clears throat> services organizations for many years, it's unfortunate that sometimes you see people are so focused on their one mission that they, you know, it becomes competitive, when in fact, whether you're working in, in housing or mental health or whatever range of issues could be there, the more we can work together holistically, the better. But oftentimes, we get kind of stovepiped for a variety of reasons, um, under, and many understandable reasons, but um, it's, there are times in which people working in, in, a, in any arena can feel like, hey, there, there's some opposition, there's some resistance to what we want to do, and so it's always good to figure out where, the, where that's coming from, and how to overcome that. Um, and then who needs to be involved to achieve the desired outcomes? Because uh, it's well known in <clears throat> the negotiation arena that when you're negotiating solutions to problems, um, if you don't have the implementers involved with you in solving some of the problems and helping figure it out, um, you're not going to get much done at the end of the day. So it's always good to ask, who needs to be involved to achieve the desired outcome? Where are we going to get the resources? And they need to be involved early on. Can't go at the very end. Well, sometimes you, you do because you don't recognize it till then. But you really try to get people engaged in developing and designing what you're going to do. So these are just, I think, some of the things that we encourage people to think about when engaging communities that can help kind of see where the dynamics are that need to be addressed to be successful. So, Greg, so, before you go yeah. on to the next question, um, yeah, yeah. Emma De La Rosa had a question about if you have a tool uh, to do the resource mm -hmm. mapping. Well, you know, it's really just in some communities, it's really already been done for us. You can get <clears throat> maybe um, a family resource center or first five has pulled all the resources together and have them in a brochure. Um, that says, you know, here are all the different programs. But a lot of times, even then, they don't necessarily include all the programs because maybe they overlook the role of, you know, prenatal care a, from a hospital or an activity at a library or whatever. So we just try to understand through our local partners, um, you know, what all the resources are and if there are some blanks, try to fill those in 
and uh, and then help people you know be aware of that. Um, so there's an example of um, Mono County. Uh, well, it disappeared before I could read it, but apparently has has some resource available. So I think uh, there are a variety of um, in maybe higher resource counties where effort's been put into that, and other counties where you really have to start almost from scratch and put it together yourself. But again, you work we work with local partners, we talk to parents, um, and kind of put put together then kind of a, a list or a map of what's what's possible. Um, so I hope that you know answers that uh, in some form or fashion. So what opportunities do parents have to engage with your organization and what is needed for them to be able to engage effectively? Now, um, the second part of this question, many of you have already answered because you were talking about time, time to get off the work for parents, time that you have in an organization to um, put into having parents involved. Um, uh, the cost and the time of transportation, there are a lot of things um, that may be needed to help enable uh, you know, effective engagement. But let's look at the first part. It'd be interesting to know what opportunities do parents have to engage with your organization? I think it might be good if we could take a minute and just have you use the chat box again and just say, do you have an advisory committee? Do you have a, a parenting uh, committee? Or, or what, what might you have that actively engages parents? within your organization. Let's just take a minute and see uh, what kind of responses we get to that, if you would. Okay, parent yes. meetings, high school health fairs, that's great. <clears throat> All good examples. I know if we have any Head Start folks on the call, they have a Head Start Policy Council, and generally speaking, they have parent committees at each one of their centers. Yeah, so I think um, sometimes outreach events, family cafes, that's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Resident advisory committees. There they go. Parent, Parent education, education classes. classes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. good. Okay. Very good. So it sounds like you have a lot of opportunities, and then the question becomes how do we get? people there, how do we sustain their involvement, and um, these are the questions that, at the end of the day, uh, okay, so yeah, we're going to talk a little bit more about how we can um, hopefully enhance or increase parent participation, you know, as we, we need it. Yeah, weekly playgroup sessions, there are just a variety of, of tools that people have to engage parents. And I think somebody asked the question earlier in the previous chat, what's in it for me, kind of that attitude? Why should I bother to come? Um, and I think the answer to that is the more we can make these activities so that when people leave, they say, hey, that was worth my time, then people will, will come back. Um, the question is, how do we create these so that they leave feeling that. And I think we can look at some ideas to help uh, bring that uh, into focus a little bit. Um, okay, great, a resource there to Mona County. So I know most of you, probably all of you, have had some training in what it means to be trauma-informed, and there's been so much focus on trauma the last two, three, four, five, actually, you know, de last decade, I guess, um, that I think we're all getting up to speed on the research done by Folletti and other work that's being done uh, subsequent to that. And um, so it's, it's great, um, uh, and I know most of you have this, but I thought, let's at least have one slide for perhaps those um, that uh, just as a reminder, just a quick summary of, of what that looks like. Um, you know, I think it's important to note also that um, I think sometimes we just kind of throw everybody into the same, you know, kind of place with trauma, but I think we all know and understand that, that people respond to trauma in different ways. And the, 
an, an act that is, or an event that is traumatic to one person may not be nearly as traumatic to another. So we all have different levels of sensitivity. Um, they might vary around different kinds of events that happen. Um, we have different personality types who respond to, to events in different ways. Um, some of it's healthy, some of it's not so healthy. And that's one of the reasons we have so many challenges now. Um, I, I see here trying to start a postpartum depression uh, group. That, that's great. Um, that's so important. One of the things that we're able to find out in our family HUI program, positive parenting program, which is not a class, it's a peer led. Uh, and I think it differentiates us a little from a lot of the programs is we actually train parent leaders to lead the group and then the curriculum helps guide people, you know, through uh, the materials designed primarily for birth of five, but we also do some testing along the way and we try to identify um, either developmental challenges of kids or maternal depression. And we're working more and more with some of the organizations here in Yellow County to really make sure that's a part of our work because it is so important. Um, so from SAMHSA, here's just a, a quick summary of some of their guidelines related to trauma. First, realizing the wide in, it, widespread impact of trauma and understanding the potential paths to recovery. So it's just realizing, yeah, there's a lot of trauma out there. I think we can all recognize there are a lot of people. And if you look at the research on this right now, Americans carry a lot of stress around with them. And a lot of times that stress translates into anger, translates into drug or alcohol abuse, uh, or just abuse of a partner. I mean, that anger and stress uh, translate into a lot of uh, dysfunction and negativity. But just realizing that, I think, you know, we're all kind of, we watch the news every day and we see multiple examples of uh, the impact of trauma, not always called out as trauma, but that's, you know, oftentimes the source. Recognizing the signs and symptoms of trauma in clients, family, staff, and others involved in the system. Sometimes we're, we're really focused on the trauma brought in by the families that we're working with uh, or, or their children, we forget that people on our staffs have trauma as well. And um, sometimes as an organization, um, we overlook the internal elements that we need to be aware of. And, and sometimes working with people with a lot of trauma is creates trauma. So we just need to, you know, recognize that as staff people or as people working in this field, we're obviously not immune to that and need to pay attention to those things as well. And then the response is by full integrate, fully integrating knowledge about trauma into policies, practices, uh, procedures, and that seek to actively resist re-traumatization. And uh, I think this is really uh, an important part. And again, it's hard for us to tell sometimes if a person is responding out of having some traumatic event. Um, it could just be their personality. It could be things other than trauma. Um, and so sometimes it's hard to fully understand, but as long as we're aware and kind of thinking about it, that's important. As an organization, if we can have, as part of our mission statement, we want to be trauma-informed. We want to make sure our organizational culture is paying attention to this. Um, it requires patience sometimes. Uh, it requires really kind of thinking through uh, how we do with people in, in quite a different way. Um, I don't remember if I heard this, and you guys probably all know this as well. You've heard this phrase, and I don't remember if it was one of the early convers uh, one of the early uh, talks I heard from Vincent Fletty or, or, or where exactly, but it kind of changed my thinking a little bit. And it's moving the question that we sometimes ask of people of what's wrong with that person to what's happened to that person. And that totally changes a reference point for trying to understand what people might have gone through to, you know, we see their actions. We don't always, normally we don't understand what fully led to those actions. But I think when we think more about, you know, instead of what's wrong with that person, what happened to that person, it gives us a little empathy to realize we're all human. We all have events in our lives that can um, manifest themselves in, in different kinds of ways. So anyway, just a little bit on trauma. I think we're all aware of the importance of that. And it's just, you know, how far have we gone towards um, trying to implement all those practices in our own lives, in our organizations, et cetera. So on this idea of community connections, um, the Campaign to Counter Childhood Diversity, 4CA, 
um, a group that came into being in 2014 to really kind of look at uh, ACEs and how to respond to uh, uh, toxic stress. Uh, they also came, part of the policy work that they did, and some of you may be involved with C4A or 4CA, um, they've come up with some guidelines, which I really like, um, uh, that talk about how to make sure that we do authentic parent engagement. And this will address some of the questions or responses that came out uh, earlier. So first, are individuals and communities most directly impacted by trauma and childhood adversity, adversity actively participating in and not just present for decision making? So I think we all understand that sometimes we're giving we're given directions that we will do certain things. We may, you know, we need to get a parent or two parents on a committee or in a group. Um, and the question is, are we just going through the motion so we can check the box or, um, you know, do we, are we really uh, actively seeking their participation and input? And if we are, it really means that we're not waiting until we have a whole system in place and inviting them in. It really means starting before that and help, having them help us design the system so that it can take into account things like, I work two jobs, when am I going to find the time off? They can help figure that out. How about child care? How about um, transportation? All those issues can be taken into account as a system is being designed. And we, as part of our OCAP contract, um, where we oversee some of the, the parents that are involved in some of the statewide programs like uh, PEI, um, the uh, uh, Prevention and Early, uh, uh, early yeah, Prevention and Early uh, Intervention, um, we found that sometimes um, parents are able to go once or twice, but it's just you know too hard to get them there, and they encounter other dynamics which we'll talk about in a minute, which makes it very difficult for them to participate uh, in an effective way. So number two, have the needs of those impacted by trauma been factored in decisions about where, when, and how to meet, et cetera, we, I think, covered that. Does participation reflect authentic engagement of individuals and communities most directly impacted by trauma? And again, um, are we really um, listening to people? Are we, are we incorporating them, their, their comments and input into the process? Or have we simply uh, taken their ideas and moved on because we have an agenda. We, you know, we, we brought this group together to do X. We're moving towards X. Yeah, great to have a parent in there, but um, we're, we're so far focused on X, sometimes we forget how do we make sure that it's authentic engagement. And that's the way we get to sustainability. If somebody comes once and feels like, hey, I'm just window dressing, they're not going to come back. But if you if people actually see their input and their voice being heard and impacting the outcome, they will come back because it's very empowering. So that's why this is you know so important. And then does the list of possible policy opportunities and tactics reflect the priorities of the individual communities most directly impacted by trauma and childhood adversity? And again, if if we're developing policies in a vacuum or tactic strategies on how to implement policies and we're not actually getting the direct input from parents who are the people that are supposed to be in families who are supposed to be the recipients, the benefactors, but also probably some of the implementers, um, we need to make sure that th their ideas are incorporated. So again, um, authentic engagement is just so uh, critical. And I think if we don't pay attention to these things, people will leave or they won't get involved to begin with. But if people get involved in a process of some kind and then tell other people, hey, that was really useful, I learned a lot there, or they listen to what I have to say, and I see how it's impacting the direction of the organization or of the policy of whatever, um, they will likely stay involved. So uh, that's at least one key piece of the puzzle. So just quickly, a couple ideas of uh, how we can help parents find their voice in community. Um, we've been part of creating uh, a program here in Yale County called Be The One. And basically, it's just built on resilience research, which just says that, you know, just one person um, engaging another person in a caring way and having a caring relationship can make all the difference. And I think, you know, we've heard this, you know, so many times in so many different ways that just having one person treat the other person with a sense of empathy and compassion and support. Uh, through difficult times can change their lives. 
And we have so many examples of parent leaders in our programs that started out wondering if they could lead a, a, a parent group of six or eight other uh, families. And the next thing you know, they're, oh, you know, I can do this. And the next thing you know, they're uh, participating on the PTA at their school. We have some people that have gone on to go back to school and be certified for childcare. And the, I mean, just example after example of just, you know, one opportunity to show that they, that people care about them or believe in them can make all the difference in the world. So you can go to um, www.bethe1yolo.org and you can see a little bit more about that program and, you know, what is, how it's trying to, you know, encourage parents and agency staff to be change makers, just one, you know, one person at a time. Uh, thanks, Shane, for that link. Um, and then there's some ways to, you know, maybe have through kind of a World Cafe approach to engage other people and get people involved. So uh, just that's just an example of how to help people have a voice and feel empowered. I've mentioned the Community Connections grants a little bit, and there are probably some of uh, your other organizations that do something similar. But what First Five SAC is doing is giving small $5,000 grants to parents and families who come together to address a specific need in their community. And then what our organization does two or three times a year as they get new parent leaders in with uh, the recipients of these grants, we take them through a training or a workshop, something similar to what we're doing here, to help them build their capacity to um, kind of lead their group, to engage their community in effective ways. Because one of the big questions is always people get burned out or, you know, how do we continue to keep this going so people stay interested and engaged? And, you know, those are not easy, um, those are not easy questions to uh, answer or issues to address. I mean, it really, you know, really have to kind of look at each individual situation and try to figure that out. But basically, they have folks, for example, that get small grants to bring a play group together. Or recently, um, a mom community wanted to make sure the young kids were understanding their um, their heritage, and so they were teaching the Hmong language. Um, we have had dads groups that uh, try to do something, you know, a little bit different in terms of, you know, play groups with dads and kids, um, just for their community. And um, and so I look at this and say this is a, an amazing program because it's helping parents and families at a very localized, even neighborhood level, almost look at what's going on in their community, identify a need, and say, we need to do something to, um, you know, to make a difference. And um, Shane's doing a great job of giving us some good connections here. Um, so that's great. So um, those kinds of things, it doesn't take a lot of money, obviously, $5,000 grants. Um, I mean, you have to have a pool, but it's not like we're giving, they're giving grants of seventy-five or even 25000 It's just enough to encourage parents to keep them going. And so some of the, 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 the chats or comments that have come in are other examples of how to do that. But I think if we can look for ways to give parents and, you know, give voice to people in the community, it really is empowering. And they see it coming from within. It's not something being delivered to them from on high. You know, that's one of the reasons I think our Family Hood program is successful is because we're helping develop peer leaders to lead their groups and then they and people in the groups, the next step for somebody in a group might be, hey, I will start a hui, and I will be, you know, I want to be trained to be a group leader in another group. And it just cascades down. And the more people kind of get empowered and see what they can do with a little encouragement and a little support is pretty amazing. So these are just some ways um, that are out there. Now, for the next few minutes I want to turn our attention to some leadership ideas because I think um, uh, that we really need to particularly in your placement in organizations you are all leaders in some capacity um, and we really want to encourage your leadership but as we talk to parents we obviously as you can tell with our programming we really try to encourage the leadership of the parents involved in our program and so if we want to define leadership in the context of family and community Here's a here's an example, I guess. It's effective engagement with structures or systems and or activities that improve the well-being of parents and or caregivers and their children. So it can be something parents do, it can be something you do, 
Um, sometimes when talking about engagement of structures and systems, that's things like being an, a parent participant on like a statewide committee or on an advisory group, you know, locally. But that's a system in place that we can engage them. But there are a lot of activities that parents can, um, yeah, Head Start, yeah, uh, some models for how to engage parents. So Head Start's, you know, great program and, and thank you. I am aware of other parenting programs um, that are in that are you know operating in California for sure. Um, let's look at <clears throat> that a, a couple aspects of leadership. Um, and then I'd like I'm going to have another question here, but I'd love it if anybody wants to weigh in. I mean, uh, you don't need to listen to me uh, you know talk the whole time because there's a lot of uh, wisdom in the group. I can tell. I mean, I would have assumed it to begin with. But I can just tell from the, the varied responses, obviously, there's a terrific experience and wisdom in the group. So by all means, if you'd like to say something um, to contribute and uh, emphasize or fill in the gap, uh, please let, you know, Carrie know. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to carry on here and just kind of move us into this leadership piece a little bit. We think about building leadership at three levels. <clears throat> and so there's a leadership that occurs within a family just to provide support for your kids um, or your spouse <clears throat> or other family members or caregivers um, and and how that exhibits itself in many different ways. Then there's leadership <clears throat> in an organization. How do we kind of move our organization to be trauma-informed, to be sensitive uh, to the needs of the people that we work with and how do we engage them in a more effective way? So we become more successful as an organization, and they, our parents, or the other people we support, are successful. Uh, and then there's kind of leader, community level leadership, where we have elected officials, uh, either in schools or commissioners or city council people, whose ideas can, and judges, for example, whose ideas can definitely impact, um, you know, kind of a pro-family or not so pro-family perspective in the way they exert their leadership. So leadership occurs at a number of different levels, and we want to recognize that. And so, you know, what does leadership look like at each of these levels? This is just more or less kind of a rhetorical question. I'm going to get. I'm going to, I've got a question about leadership for you in a minute, but uh, I just wanted to drill down a little bit on just the idea that within a family. Um, if you just get to the point that, uh, for example, in some of our hui, uh, the moms are involved more than the dads. They bring the material home, kind of leave the notebook out on the dining room table or whatever. They engage in conversations. That's, that's taking leadership in your family to kind of share what you're learning with other people. It's leadership when you see that, you know, maybe it would be good to go to the school and find out who your children's teachers are and let them know that you're there to support your kids. Um, so leadership at, at that level can be just community engagement or engagement with the, the, in the immediate environment of where the family is situated. Um, organizational leadership, though, takes on a little different level or can take on a little different level of having to kind of work with sometimes what I call the organizational inertia of, of any organization. Every organization has a culture, and a lot of times I think of it as having an inertia that just kind of moves people down without even knowing it, moves people down a certain path. And sometimes that path is not healthy for the organization. It's not healthy for the people in the organization. It's not healthy for the people that serve. So sometimes an organization uh, requires some leadership to bring that to the attention, to figure out a way to cobble together support, to change that direction, and to revitalize or transform that to uh, help at every at each of those three levels, um, the personal, the organizational, and the, the your client uh, base uh, all succeed uh, and achieve uh, better, you know, more success in in what you're trying to accomplish. And then at the community level, uh, sometimes you see people step up and say, hey, "I'm going to run." I don't see our school district responding the way it should. I don't see our our local government responding. And so sometimes people step up. Um, to get involved and uh, say, you know, I'm going to uh, run for office or I'm going to get on a committee that can shape the future or 
maybe it just starts with going, starting to go to the city council or county commission meetings and letting your voice be heard to try to shape the future. So leadership comes in many, many different, I, I, that's the point. Because a lot of times we think of leadership, okay, a leader is somebody who's got a title or a degree or has been appointed into this position. And I think we can look at zillions of opportunities or zillions of examples, rather, of people who have been put into positions of leadership who are not very effective leaders. They were perhaps effective at what they did, but they may not be very effective, you know, prior to being put in a leadership position, but they may not be effective leaders. And so um, that's why we're talking about leadership. I've, I've been involved with so many organizations at every level over the years where leadership is just lacking because we don't focus on what does a good leader look like and there are all these ideas about what leadership looks like um, but unfortunately the ideas and the reality are not always uh, consistent and I will say as a person who is in at least some level of leadership in a small nonprofit um, it's not always easy and I don't always do it perfectly but um, as long as we have our aspiration to deliver in a positive way, um, you know, we're on the right track. And, you know, hopefully over time, we are more and more effective at, at doing that. Um, so this is the question I'd like you to answer, if you could. In fact, maybe there's a poll on this. Um, there is a poll on this, <laughs> which I am going to launch. Yes. And I will say, yeah, go ahead, and then I'll come back to the comment I just saw about communication. So please do go ahead with the poll. Okay. So here's your question. What do you see as the leadership challenges or obstacles uh, within your organization related to parent engagement? So lack of financial, personnel resources, low sense of need, interest within the community, lack of knowledge about how to engage parents effectively, all of the above, or other. So I will wait for a little while while you're all voting. We only have 40, we're almost to halfway. I'm going to keep going for a little longer. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to close this poll in five, four, three, two, one. And I'm going to share the results. So 26% said lack of financial personnel resources, 8% low sense of need, interest within the community, 28% lack of knowledge about how to engage parents effectively, 28% all of the above, and 10% other. So I would be interested in what that other is. Yeah, let's uh, share some of those. <clears throat> Were they designated? Those what do you put, see? I guess what do people just have to say in a chat box with the other dogs. In the chat, yeah, in the chat <clears throat> box. Uh, Rachel says, in our tiny county, we seem to have more job positions that focus on systems change than we do direct service delivery. Lot, a lot of people who create change, but little to see the work completed. No. Good, good okay. comment. Yeah. yeah, very good. I think it's. Uh, I have to. I, I want to add right here that there has just been some incredible chat going on, Greg. I don't know if you can see it. There even is uh, some networking going on in between some of your participants. Uh, we are exchanging email addresses with each other to continue Fabulous. conversation when you are done. And I just really need to do a shout out to my um, to my colleague Shane Mazur, who is very good at monitoring the chat box and throwing in some resources and some websites here and there. So thank you, Shane, for covering that for us. Yeah, he's doing a great job, and he's it's almost instantaneous. So I'm impressed. Yeah. Um, well, and he, I think and he is a she. <laughs> oh, she. Sorry, Shane. Yeah, that's okay. I've got two um, nie grand or nieces uh, whose names are Miller and Campbell, so you know I should realize that these are not gender specific anymore. Uh, 
So, um, yeah, thanks, though, Shane, for that, because it's uh, really helpful. And um, I, was, I was just going to note that on the poll, there was a small percentage of people, um, <laughs> uh, there's a small percentage of people who say the need is low. Right. So, I mean, that's good because everybody is seeing, yeah, there is there is the need to do this. So it's not the absence of recognizing need. It's other things. It's resources. It's it's time. It's uh, understanding you know, how to do it. And that's why we're doing this this uh, this webinar. And hopefully this is going to help uh, think through some of this in a little more effective way and hopefully help open some doors for those of you that you know want to do a little bit more community engagement. Hopefully this will be be helpful. Um, one of the questions that came up was, uh, or comments that I saw briefly was about communication, how important communication is in leadership. And I could not agree with you more. Um, that's going to show up here in a minute on one of our next slides, that communication is hugely important and, um, uh, and, 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 and communication is hard. Let's just note that. Um, we all have the filters that we put what we communicate in as it goes out from us and then the filters we have when we hear something from somewhere else from someone else and sometimes they align and sometimes they don't there are ways to try to get those to align and I'll only briefly but I will briefly talk about those um, momentarily so <clears throat> let's talk about facilitative leadership <clears throat> excuse me and I'm noting the time and I want to make sure we have at the end to do some just open conversation but um, here is uh, some basic concepts of, of facilitative leadership that I think are important for us to grasp as, as leaders in the, in the public uh, arena. And um, so one, be open to learning and adapting. I think um, leaders who just get caught up in one way of thinking about things and who think it's just, their role is just to push through you know, their agenda without kind of considering other things or without adapting the circumstances or learning new information that might give them a better outcome, um, you know, are not effective leaders. So we have to be open to learning and adapting. I mean, like number one. Um, so, you know, as an organization, one of our, one of our organizational uh, internal missions is to be a learning organization. We're trying to learn as we go. And as you all can well imagine in the work we all do, uh, it's a daily, <laughs> it's a daily operation. Learning new things about how to interact with our staff, how to our staff interacts with with our the people we work with. Learning from the people we work with. I mean, it's just a continual thing. Involve others in developing a, a facilitative leader will involve others in developing a shared vision and outcome. In other words, it won't be um, I'm just going to make this decision on my own because research will show that if people are not involved in helping develop a vision and an outcome, they're much less likely to help implement it. And um, so we have to get people uh, involved in kind of creating a shared vision and outcome. Now, at the end of the day, decisions still need to be made. But, you know, we can make a decision, and even if it's not what other people think, we explain to them, we, we listen to five different people, and we kind of combine all that to come up with the outcome or a shared vision. And it may not be exactly what one person articulated, but you can we can help people understand how they contributed to the outcome, or if we weren't able to respond to that, why? Because most of the time, as long as people know that they were heard and, and their ideas were given a chance, but it's, it's when people put ideas out there and never see it responded to, never see it incorporated, that's, the, what, that's what alienates people. So good leaders need to figure out a way to create that shared vision. Uh, develop the capacity of others. Again, um, Think about uh, who's going to replace me. You know, how can I develop the capacity of others? How can I develop the capacity in our work of parents to better parent their kids and to be the leaders in their families and ultimately the leaders in their communities? Um, so developing the capacity of others is, is really a critical aspect of, of leadership. Not I'm going to hold all the information to myself and all the experience to myself, so I'm going to be the only one that benefits. Um, and then that just puts me in a stronger position in, you know, as a leader. No. I mean, we should be building the capacity of everybody around us uh, as well. Listening effectively relates to communication. And um, if you, I've got a great video that, that I show in some of my workshops that, that it's actually from Australia. And it asks community leaders in Australia what the most 
I use it because it's only four or five minutes long. Um, but um, about a third of them talk about a good leader listens. And, um, you know, there's a, what, what we train our peer leaders, and our training that we do for our, our peer leaders is on communication, how to listen effectively and use this concept of reflective listening. So it gets to this issue I was mentioning earlier about how difficult communication can be. So when somebody says something, you just simply repeat it back. I mean, it's that simple. You just say, I hear you saying A, B, and C. And it gives that person an opportunity to say, yeah, you know, that's exactly what I'm saying. Or, no, that's not quite what I mean. What I really mean is, and then you just keep going through that till you finally get to a point where, hey, we're, okay, well, now we're communicating effectively with each other. We know what the, per the other person's thinking, and now we can, you know, have a, have a, a good conversation about that. Um, so often <clears throat> we make assumptions and kind of act off those assumptions, and they could be totally wrong because we're putting our own, how we're feeling today, or our own personality, our own life experience in there, and we're not really testing what we're hearing to see if I'm hearing this accurately. So a good leader needs to be, uh, needs to be a good listener. Modeling transparency and trustworthiness. Um, I said, as I said earlier, kind of helping people understand why a decision was made, even if they don't agree with it. And that helps build trustworthiness. Um, there's a, there's a, some recent research out that said 60% of people in corporate settings, 60% of people do not trust their, their immediate boss. And I'm thinking, that's horrible. Um, and, you know, tr the, the, the challenge with trust is it only takes one event to break trust, and then it takes a long time to rebuild it back. And sometimes things happen that break that trust because of miscommunication or misunderstanding. But if we can identify that trust is an issue, we can be working on it. But sometimes we just don't want to go there. But again, very important for leaders. Balance humility with decisiveness. Um, you know, there's a great book that came out a few years ago by a Stanford researcher called Good to Great. And uh, he looked at one of the qualities of the, the leaders of organizations that were classified as great. And the leaders were were all rec had at some level represented a level of humility. If there was success, he, they passed it on to the people who did the work. If there was uh, a failure or something didn't go quite right, they take it on themselves. Um, at some level, decisions still need to be made. Um, great job, Shane. Um, and, and so decisions still need to be made, of course. Uh, so there needs to be decisiveness in that. We can't just waffle and never make a decision. But, um, you know, it's just kind of balancing all these things. And then finally, recognize and account for the impact of trauma. And again, just to kind of throw that in there, it's something that I've, read, I've added more recently. It's just sometimes challenging to see how much somebody is impacted by trauma, either people we work with or the people that you know, we serve, um, but we do our best. And accounting for that can be challenging because we don't know exactly how to respond, but it usually requires patience. and. Um, Sometimes um, just trying to listen and, and not responding because we just need to try to understand the situation as best we can. So this is all challenging, but I really think this is a model for effective leadership in at kind of any level. Um, so uh, yeah, if people have questions about that. Maybe we can you know come back to that when we uh, finish the next couple of slides and see if people want to delve into that uh, any further. <clears throat> I've been doing a conflict resolution for also some undesignated period of time, over two decades. We'll just leave it at that, um, but uh, quite a while. And um, in all kinds of settings, um, you know, and, and what we find is uh, there are certain tools we can use to address conflict more effectively. And we're all going to engage in conflict at some point because we don't communicate properly, or we do, we jump to conclusions, or we've had a bad day, or our feelings got hurt, or, I mean, there's a zillion reasons that <clears throat> conflict can be created at any level. Somebody that you don't know, and your your spouse, or somebody that is closest to you, we, you know, we, conflict can occur at any level. And so we need to figure out how to deal with it effectively. And unfortunately, um, it's something that people fear. Um, because a lot of times people, I think in newer generations, we're teaching peer mediation in schools and things like that. And people are getting a little more accustomed to it. But prior to that, we didn't really do much to help people figure out how to solve conflict in an effective way. And so a lot of us that are a little bit older than when peer mediation was in, in schools, just as one example, um, 
we find that a lot of times people want to uh, repress or avoid conflict uh, because either it's stressful or they don't know how to deal with it or it's just easier. So here are five research shows that there are five basic ways. Well, it's always, you know, the flight or fight, which is kind of the classic, but moving beyond the fight or flight, there are five ways people typically kind of react to conflict. And the more we can understand these, the more we can be prepared to deal with it. So some people are just going to avoid conflict. And research shows about 60% of people typically avoid for the reasons I mentioned, because it's not comfortable, creates stress, et cetera, et cetera. There are times to avoid it. Maybe it's an issue that's not that important to you. But if you always fall into, and it's true with all of these, if you always fall into a pattern of avoiding or whatever, then we're, uh, you know, probably going to, you know, create conflict by doing so. And that's typically what happens, right? Um, it's kind of like try to sweep something under the rug. It's the tempest in a teapot. Eventually it boils over. Um, so avoiding conflict, if that's our modus operandi, that's the way we typically respond. Um, we need to kind of rethink that. Another approach is accommodating. If somebody wants something different than what we want, we just give it to them. It's just easier. Um, again, if it's not very important and it's important to them, why not accommodate their interests? But if it's important to us also, and we just kind of turn it over, we haven't really done anything to solve the problem. But some people just accommodate because, again, it's just almost like avoidance, but they're just very accommodating to the point of kind of never asserting their own interests and what you know would be helpful to them. Then there's the idea of compromise. And Another way of thinking about this is the least common denominator solution. In other words, you find something that works for both people, but most of the time you're leaving what could have been a better solution on the table. I'll give you a quick example of that in a second. Um, competing. And I put the word aggressive out there because I don't want the competing part to be misrepresented here, but that's what's used in the literature. But what it really means is somebody who's aggressively going to pursue their what they want. And so they're not really interested in what you want. And so they're just going to be very aggressive in trying to hold to uh, a situation or respond in an aggressive way. And that can be also difficult to deal with. But again, there are tools for doing that. And finally is the idea of collaborate. And, um, and this is really kind of trying to figure out what your interests are, what the other person's interests are, and then figure out, hey, what's the solution that meets all of our interests? And so... I start with the understanding the reaction to conflict because if we can understand that people respond in different ways, they won't catch us off guard. And sometimes people say, oh, good, avoiding. I can just do whatever I want or accommodating. But at the end of the day, that's going to backfire because people will eventually say, hey, you know, that's not working out. And, if the, and, and so it's really not, you know, we sometimes think we're taking advantage of people, but it's not a good practice. So there's a great book, Getting to Yes by Roger Fisher and Bill Urey, and uh, it's very simple. It's a great read. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend getting this book and reading it. It lays out what's called interest-based negotiation, and it relates to the collaboration piece. It's understanding what people's interests are. So, number one, understand the underlying interests of all involved. I'm going to give you a very simple example from their book just to make this point. Two people um, are in the produce stand in a grocery store. They go to reach for the last orange that's there. And they both have their hand on it and look at each other wondering, okay, what am I going to do? And the produce person walks by and they say, hey, do you have any more oranges? And, 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 and the produce person says, no, we don't. Um, but, you know, it's carrying a knife around and says, yeah, I'll be glad to cut it in half. You can both have half the orange. And so they say, fine. And, um, and so that's a compromise, right? They've both taken half the orange. But one person goes home and peels the orange and eats the fruit. And the other person goes home and peels their half of the orange and uses the rind to bake a cake. And had they understood what their interests were, one person could have had the entire fruit, the other person could have had the entire rind. Now, it's an oversimplified example, but the point is, if we understand what people's interests are, we have a way to solve those problems more effectively than if we just compromise or don't understand what the interests are. Because if they had figured that out in the grocery store, they could have both walked away with what you know entirely what they wanted now sometimes you don't get entirely the outcome you're looking for in a conflict but there are ways to try to as i say using this interest-based approach to find ways to um to use a metaphor increase the size of the pie before you cut it up um and and, and make some decisions now what's the relevance of some of this to community engagement well any activity that brings people together has the opportunity 
or any time we're exerting leadership, um, there are opportunities for conflict. And so we need to be able to recognize when conflict is there. It can happen in body language, what somebody says. Um, there are a lot of ways to kind of identify conflict. But as leaders, we need to figure out how to solve those in an effective way because to just let them go on without any um, without responding in, in appropriate ways um, is, is problematic. And uh, then as a leader, if we're not dealing with conflict in an effective way, we're becoming avoiders. And so we really need to try to get to the bottom and try to figure it out. Now, sometimes people get very emotional about this stuff, and that's what oftentimes makes it difficult. But the more we can kind of keep the emotion out and focus on the interests, you know, the better. Okay, another concept from getting the end, separate the people from the problem. Sometimes it's people issues, not, not the, the substance of the problem that's the issue, but it's challenges between the people involved or engaged with the situation. And it's helpful to make that distinction because that's a whole different set of solutions than if it's issue, if it's issue oriented. So that's another key concept. Third, look for opportunities for mutual gain. Be creative, open to new ideas. This is really important because um, when you learn more about the other people's interests, you might have come into a situation saying, I know the solution to this. But when you know more about what people's interests are, it might open up whole new ideas. Oh, well, if that's the case, we can do this. But we have to be open to that. A lot of times people come into these things thinking they know the one solution, and they close their minds to the ideas that could come from doing this kind of interest-based approach. So be open to mutual gain and to new ideas. Um, to the extent possible, look for objective criteria in which to base outcomes. It may be that funding just simply doesn't exist for a suggestion. And if you can just say, hey, you know, our budget's $50,000 to do this. It costs 100000 We simply can't do that now. But maybe you move on to say, well, let's see how we raise the other 50000 so we can do this next year. But looking for objective criteria sometimes is a way to help um, come to a conclusion. And then finally, um, just test assumptions before acting and reacting. Uh, because, again, so much conflict comes from making assumptions and then acting on that or reacting to it. And it just it's just unnecessary conflict, unnecessary drama. And I think we all have enough going on in our lives. We don't need created stress and drama because people are, you know, making assumptions about what we said or what we did. And, you know, it can happen with our staff. It can happen with the people we work with. It can happen with uh, our partners, we're working with another organization about something. There's a little bit of a misunderstanding. It can happen at every level. So we just need to be very, uh, very aware of that. Okay, let's see here. Ah, so it looks like we've come through, um, and we did it in pretty good time. Um, what I have prepared for you, I know there's tons of things that we could talk further about. I will say that um, I want to open this up now for any questions that people might want to put in the chat box. I'll try to answer them. Um, I know somebody a while back said, do we offer workshops? And the answer to that is yes, through our uh, community leadership program. We do workshops on all these subjects, on community engagement, leadership, conflict resolution. Um, and uh, I'd be more than happy to talk to any of you if you'd like to bring this to your organization, bring it to your community. Um, and then what I always try to do is tailor it specifically to the needs of the organization or the community because we all have different needs and it helps us kind of direct the conversations one way or the other, try to make them highly interactive using real, real life, you know, situations that people are encountering, not just some theoretical or hypothetical scenario. So yes is the answer to that question that was raised earlier. But let me just uh, be quiet here and see if anybody wants to pose a question or actually speak a question, which we're totally open to that. Yes, so if you if you raise your hand, I can unmute you, so you can ask Greg your question directly. But Donna Jackson um, is asking if you could share the orange analogy in writing. She loves that, <laughs> so maybe if you could write up a little blurb, I can send that out when I send out the PowerPoint and the link to the recording. And, uh, I, and then I can send that I, to everybody. I can certainly do and, that, but I will say I, I borrowed that from Fisher and Uri's uh, Getting to Yes book. They actually use that example in the book because it's okay. just so, you know, clever. I wish right. I could claim it. I wish I could claim it to be my <laughs> own, but I can't. You're giving, so, uh, you're giving credit where credit is due. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I'll be glad to write it up, though, for those that 
I'm not planning to get the book, but I highly recommend it. It's an easy read. Um, if okay. you've never read it, you'll learn tons from it. Okay. And and I'd like to propose to the audience also, while, we're, while we are waiting for your questions to come in, um, I would love to uh, have Greg back and just give a webinar on leadership um, to spend a lot more time on those last couple of slides and really going through uh, facilitative leadership and conflict resolution. I'm seeing a yes, yes, yes uh, from Donna. So I'm kind of putting Greg on the spot. Obviously, I will talk to him in private. But as you were giving that, I thought that that might be a very um, appropriate webinar for the state, you know, for everybody that is working in, you know, Community-based organizations, nonprofits, working with families, working with partners. Um, so, see, we're getting a lot of yeses on those on that one, Greg. So, I will talk to you about that later. Okay. I, I knew if I put it out there that I'd get response from the audience, which is what my goal was. Yeah. So, does anybody have any questions to ask Greg, either in person or through the chat box? I've just put on the last slide, which has my email and my phone number, our website. We have actually a separate, uh, we have a, a separate um, uh, website um, for our Family Hui program just because it, there's so much going on there. Um, so we have a couple different websites there and our Facebook. And on our Lead for Tomorrow website, we actually have links to our Facebook and other activity for Africa, if you're interested in what we're doing in Africa. Um, but yeah, so there are a lot of resources there, and uh, if, if if need be. So Shane wants to know what you know about Parents Anonymous. Um, I don't know a lot about uh, Parents Anonymous. Um, I yeah. Uh, okay. So that's fair. <laughs> yeah, I mean we we've studied you know most of the other. Uh, programs in the state and um, you know I've probably I'm sure you know back in my recesses I've I've read about it um, I, I just I wouldn't be able to quote any particulars but okay. we try to keep abreast of the other folks that are doing work in parenting to learn from them and to see what they're doing and so we you know we always try to be aware of other people doing this work we can't have enough people working in this arena can we Oh, that is so I'm true. I, just, I missed the last question that just came up. Let me see if I figure out a way to put it up. Donna wants to know, what is one of the most successful get-togethers that Greg has seen in his own organization or organizations? Well, um, that's a it's, a it's a great question. Um, with with our, I mean, I, I guess I could answer that at different levels. I mean, if we look at it through the lens of Family Hui, I mean, I would say every time we get one, and, and the way Family Hui program works is it's groups of six to ten families that get together for 12 weeks initially, and then are, are go and to go through a, a birth to five curriculum, and then we we hope they'll stay, and most of the time people do stay connected after. Um, and so I would say every one of our Hui is a, is a good example of bringing parents together and empowering them and helping them kind of understand their own challenges and how that translates into parenting. And so that's an example. Um, the workshops we're doing for for First Five SAC, I find very gratifying because we're working with a bunch of uh, parent leaders who are just gutsy enough to say, you know, I think we can do this without really knowing it and stepping out and taking a chance. And uh, yeah. so I love those. Um, and I've, I've been involved with, you know, over the years with some huge groups um, and, and the number of which have been very satisfying, but um, I guess that's the way I would answer that question for okay. now. And then Karen Tyson wants to know, do you have a suggestion for working with the government contract obligations for providing programs and services that don't necessarily meet the community needs any longer? Wow. That's a good question. That's a great question. Um, so I'm assuming there, and so let me test an assumption, that you're referring to a program that was funded 
that is no longer meeting the needs, but it's still there, even though it's not really accomplishing what was it was intended to accomplish either because it, the need has been satisfied or it wasn't effective. I'm going to just assume for a minute that that's what you're uh, asking. My experience with government contracts is it depends on how it was written. If they've narrowed it down to you can do these three things, and this is how you're going to achieve your objectives, and it's not one of those three things, some contracts are going to keep you from being able to do it. But if the contract's written so it's going to be, um, um, here are three things among others that we might do. And we try to write our contracts that way so that it keeps the door open for adapting. Because, you know, maybe you start out with a program that's great for a year and you know, evolves into something else. So, unfortunately, my only answer to this is it really depends on the language and the contract. And I just encourage everybody when we write contracts to recognize the kind of evolutionary organic aspects of this work and try to keep a few doors open to be able to adapt. And, you know, I realize sometimes it's possible and sometimes it's not. So I wish I had a better answer for you, but that's no, what comes I think to that, mind. I think that's a good, a good answer. I'm going to uh, switch the screen back over to me. I'm assuming that everybody can now see my screen. Um, first of all, I just want to thank Greg for an excellent, excellent uh, presentation this morning. It was extremely informative. I want to thank all of you as participants for sticking with us and for your wonderful questions and comments. Just to let you know that this session is being recorded and it will be on our Strategies 2.0 YouTube channel. Um, where you can get this webinar and other past webinars. You can get recordings from our learning communities and the series of four webinars on vehicles for change that just took place. Um, I'd also like to invite you to go to our, our website, which is uh, www.strategyca.org to see what other webinars are coming up. We still have three webinars left for this fiscal year. If you have a webinar topic and or presenter that you think would be absolutely fabulous, please do not hesitate to let me know that. I would uh, love to follow up with you on that. Um, you will get an evaluation sent to you automatically. We ask that you please participate in that evaluation process that really helps us with future uh, webinars. Case management webinars would be great. Oh, yes, they would be. Um, I want to remind you that we have learning communities going on throughout the state of California. That's a wonderful way for all of you to get together and share your ideas and thoughts and network with each other. So please go to our website and look at everything that Strategies has going on throughout the state. Um, it's been my pleasure and honor to facilitate this webinar with you today, and we hope to see you on our next webinar, which will be on May 21st at 2 o'clock, I believe it's, no, it's at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, 1 o'clock in the afternoon from 1 to 2.30, and it's being presented by our ACES Connections. So thank you so much, Greg, for your time, and we will you. talk soon. Okay. Excellent. I'm going to now... Uh, in this webinar.